Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia and managed by LiveChamp. Today's session is going to be on structured warrants. So it, this is titled Navigating Market Turbulence with Warrants. I'm sure that all of you here who have come across some stock that ends with stock code like you know, uh, C1, C2, CA, or some even start with H. So you might be wondering, what are these things? What are these instruments? Are they the mother share or these are some other things? Okay. And uh, if you are wondering what are these things, yes, they are structured warrants. And uh, I'm sure that you've heard of the, the term structured warrants for some of you here. And uh, even though we have learned structured warrants, but sometimes it can appear very complicated because there are many Greek you know, symbols there. And uh, you know, so today, our, we have invited a renowned issuer on uh, the in Malaysia to talk about structured warrants. Okay, so who else to ask for for structured warrants? The best to ask for is from the issuer themselves. All right, so we are very honored to have one of the issuers here in Malaysia to come and join us on this webinar brought to you by Bursa Malaysia. So let me go to the most important slide, which is this disclaimer. So whatever we cover on this webinar is only for educational purpose. In no way that we give any buy or sell recommendation to any stock or any warrants that uh, the speaker uh, does any case study on. So in the, in the event that you do any trading, you're 100% responsible for your own financial decisions. Okay. So uh, allow me to introduce the speaker today. Okay. Ms. Amy joined the banking industry back in 2013, where she started as a market risk executive covering several treasury products and equity products. So after being in a bank for three years, so she moved to become a senior associate in an advisory arm involved in financial risk advisory for financial institutions. She returned to the banking industry in 2018 and is now a Warren specialist in RHB Investment Bank. So. Amy has two years of experience training more than 1,500 retail investors in structured products. Wow. Across two or more than uh, 20 seminars and talks. So in fact, I had the opportunity to uh, speak alongside Amy, I think for the past two years in uh, several uh, events and, uh, and uh, webinars together. So very excited to invite you uh, back on with us here today, Amy. Yeah. Are you ready to rock the house? Yes. Yes, very excited to have uh, RHB as an issue to come and join us on this uh, webinar. So uh, without further ado, we are all can't wait to learn from you about Warren. So let me just make you a presenter. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you have you have always wondering what are structured warrants and you want to learn more. Okay, this is the session for you. Okay, so yes, we are seeing your slide right now. All right, cool. Yeah, good to go. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay. hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully that everybody is safe at home during this CMCO period. And um, uh, and thankfully that everybody is actually, I think many of you are actually joining us tonight, actually almost a full house uh, of uh, 500 over uh, attendees. And uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to, before I start talking about warrants, maybe we look at the advantages of actually trading warrant during a volatile market. So if you know that this year, the market, especially in Malaysia, has been very, very volatile. Like you can see like um, some stocks going way up and then it drops again and then it keeps going up and down, up and down. So what is what we meant by the volatile market. So one of the advantages of trading Warren during this kind of market is that you actually can gain exposure to the mother share at a lower price. So instead of maybe um, trading uh, mother share like Supermax at a high price, maybe it, to gain exposure but at a lower price, you may do it through um, Warrens. Besides that, one of the advantages is also the um, liquidity providers uh, so basically the liquidity providers meaning to say a market maker uh, are available during the market making hours so when it comes to warrants um, we have this thing called the market maker so this market maker are actually the ones that actually provide the liquidity for this product to be traded here and there uh, for example, if you're talking about the shares itself, so shares, um, how does liquidity um, works for shares is that 
um, it's based on your demand and supply. So people putting up like the uh, number of volumes there and sometimes it might, um, so when it comes to warrant itself, the issuer itself, it's what we call the market maker. So we provide fair prices up there um, so that uh, investors can actually trade this product, enter and exit their position um, easily. So besides that, uh, one of the advantages is also that uh, when it comes to warrants, you tend to see a higher percentage returns, but also note that it comes with a higher risk as well. Um, so because this is a leveraged product, so you have to take into account that these are also quite a risky product. Um, on the other hand, um, we also um, warrants allows you to take a view on both a bullish or bearish on the mother share. And it's catered more towards uh, shorter term investors rather than a uh, longer term investor. So usually uh, less than a year, uh, which I will explain it later about um, the difference between the structured warrants and company warrants. And, um, and until end of this year, there is no stamp duty for any trades in warrants. So that could be one of the advantages as well for trading this warrant because you get that stamp duty waiver, but it's until end of year 2020. So I think you have about until end of this December to actually enjoy this um, benefit. And last but not least, also for warrants, uh, recently you also can get exposure to foreign markets in Malaysia. Um, so some issuers actually do issue um, some index warrants uh, over the foreign markets like the S&P 500, Hang Seng Index. And recently also um, there's uh, one issuer, uh, one of the issuer, RHB actually uh, has uh, issued um, a Hong Kong stock warrants right here in Malaysia, which we will explain uh, later on on these uh, warrants, uh, foreign markets. So... Um, talking about the advantages, now we go on to what exactly are warrants. So they're actually a derivative. So what we mean by derivative is it's derived um, from somewhere. So the prices are derived from somewhere, meaning to say that it tracks the performance of the mother share. So if you're talking about core warrants, if the mother share goes up, your core warrant actually goes up. So this is what we meant that is tracking and uh, is derived from somewhere. And it trades like shares listed on the exchange. So meaning to say that as long as you have a trading account, um, how you trade your shares is the same way as how you actually trade um, the warrant. So for you to buy and sell this is the same way as how you buy and sell the shares, just like on the exchange. And last but not least, um, there are a lot of terms when it comes to warrants. So it could be quite uh, complicated for some people that might think that, well, all these things like exercise price, expiry date, exercise ratio. So all these terms are in the warrants. And all these terms actually um, make up to um, other warrant lingo, such as sensitivity and effective gearing, where issuers actually, uh, based on these uh, terms, they actually derive what are the sensitivity and effective gearing for these warrants. And all these are the popular terms and lingo that you actually see in this warrant uh, market, which of course we will also cover when the coming um, during this whole session. So like I mentioned just now, um, there are actually two types of warrants actually in the market. So you actually have this thing called the structure warrant and company warrant. So a lot of people may be more familiar with company warrants as compared to structured warrants. But uh, in this whole session, when we are talking about uh, navigating the market turbulence with uh, with warrants, we're actually referring to actually structured warrants. So to give a comparison on what is company warrants and structured warrants, if you take a look at the screen, um, so structured warrants are typically issued by financial institution. So what I mean by this is that it's actually issued by a third party issuer, not the company itself. Let's take for example, if you are looking at um, let's say, for example, Data Sonic. So, if you are looking at Data Sonic's company warrant, you are actually the warrant Data Sonic is actually issued by Data Sonic itself. But Data Sonic structured warrant is actually issued by third party issuer, typically investment banks, for example, uh, RHB, uh, um, Macquarie, Kananga, and so on. So, if you're talking about Data Sonic structured warrant, it's actually issued by people like RHB. So what happened by this is that um, the maturity for structured warrants are typically 6 to 12 months. So a shorter date as compared to company warrants, which is usually more than a year and it can go up to 10 years. And there is this thing called a market maker for structured warrants where 
the issuer themselves will provide liquidity for this product. Whereas for company warrant, uh, there is no market maker for this. And prices for the structured warrant is usually priced based on the um, uh, price matrix where you can see all the fair prices, but company warrants, your prices are mainly like your shares driven by the demand and supply in the market. And the naming convention for both are very different. So this is the thing that you would know how to determine whether I am actually buying a company warrant or I'm actually buying a structured warrants. So if I buy a structured warrants, the name tends to be um, dash C A or dash H. So C for core warrants and H for put warrants. Whereas the company warrant is usually the W. So take for example, just now the same um, underlying, let's say I'm saying data sonic. So if I'm looking at data sonic um, core warrant, the naming convention convention will probably be D sonic dash C eighteen or D sonic dash H ten. So if I see a H or a C, that is the structured warrant. But if I see data sonic D sonic dash W A, then that W is actually talking about the company warrant. So what what's the difference between these two is also that. At the expiry date, if let's say you hold onto these two warrants, um, the structure warrants and company warrants, uh, what happened at the expiry date is there'll be a settlement. So usually for company warrants, most of the time, your settlement is actually physical settlement, meaning to say that at the expiry date, I have the right to actually buy the underlying share, convert the warrant into the underlying share and buy the underlying share at a specific uh, price where it's determined in my contract, which is your exercise price. Whereas for structured warrant, it's actually cash settled. So cash settled meaning that it will be converted, but uh, it will be uh, settled in cash. You cannot buy the share. So that's why what we meant by structured warrant is usually a, a trading instrument as a short term because the difference will be given to you in cash instead of giving you the right to actually buy the um, share in the market in at the expiry date. So um, just now I mentioned also there are two types of structured warrants. One is the core warrant and one is the put warrant. So the core warrant actually increases in value if the share actually, sorry, the core warrant actually increases in value if the share actually goes up, but actually it drops in value if the share goes down. So it's uh, both warrants are actually following your mother share. Basically, if um, for core warrant, if your mother share goes up, right? So then your core warrant will also go up. It will follow. But if your mother share goes down, for core warrant, it actually goes down as well. Whereas for put warrant, it's the other way around. The put warrant will increase in value if your share actually goes down, but it will drop in value if the share actually goes up. So in other words, if you have a bullish view on this mother share, this particular stock, and you want to gain a leverage exposure, you may want to you have, you may look at the call warrant because that's where when your value goes up and uh, your call warrant also goes up. But if you have a bearish view, then you look, may look at the put warrant. So it, your value will go up if your mother share actually goes down. So there's the two different convention. And as I mentioned just now, um, to determine which is a core warrant and which is a put warrant, um, you look at the H and the C. So if you see the C, that is the core warrant. If you see the H, those are put warrant. So don't don't um, get confused. I know uh, some people might get confused that, oh, maybe the H is a continuation from the C because C has uh, finished already. But um, no, just to put it out there, the put warrant is actually the one with the H and call warrants the one with a C. So continuing from that, um, for example, let's say um, you are okay, you think that you want to try um, to trade or invest in structured warrants. So uh, what actually happens if you actually hold it until expiry? Like I mentioned just now, structured warrants are cash settled. You cannot convert to actually buy the mother share because that would be the company warrant. So for structured warrants, we, we look at this term, what we call, before we, we decide and know what is the end game for call warrants and put warrants, uh, it's good to know that what are the difference between uh, in the money, at the money, out of the money. So these are the three uh, common terms that you might hear 
issuers actually uh, mentioning like, oh, this call warrant is trading in the money. Or, this call warrant is trading out of the money. So what exactly it means is that um, if you look at the call warrant, as long as your share price is above your exercise price, this is what we call an in the money call warrant. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the other end, uh, when your share price is actually below your exercise price, then for this particular call warrant, we call it out of the money call warrant. So some people might ask like, oh, how come it's out of the money, but how come my warrant still has value? So this is what we call the time value of the warrants. So there are two different um, value of a warrants. One is what we call the intrinsic value. And the other one is what we call the time value. So when your warrant is in the money, this is what we call the intrinsic value. So basically, three ringgit fifty cent minus three ringgit that's a fifty cent. So that's what we call intrinsic value. Uh, but then that, but then you might see how come our warrant price is actually priced at sixty cents instead of fifty cents. So this is what we call the time value because as long as your warrant has not expired, there's actually some value to it where we actually call the time value. So even if your warrants are out of the money your warrants might still see a warrant price. There's a still value to your warrant price because of this particular time value as long as um, your warrant hasn't expired yet. So moving on to, moving on to that, um, we will see that once I talk about in the money, at the money, out of the money, then you come to think about it like, okay, now I'm holding a call warrant, right? So what happens if, do I sell it? Uh, before the expiry date, can I sell it before the expiry date? The answer is yes. Uh, so these are tradable every day as long as the market is open. You can actually buy and sell, buy and sell this product just like your shares. But just remember that if you've forgotten that you actually bought this warrant, if you've forgotten and you actually held it until expiry, what happens to my warrant? So on the screen, you can actually see this is how the end game works. What we call the end game is meaning until expiry date. So you're holding it until expiry date. So let's say today in the example, this is just an example for information purposes only. Let's say for example, Supermax. Supermax share price, nine ringgit, 90 cents. Call warrant price is at four ringgit. So you go to the market, it's selling at four ringgit for the warrants. So you buy 1,000 unit um, of this um, four, uh, four ringgit worth of Supermax shares. Uh, then this supermarket share actually has an exercise price of one ringgit and um, thirty cents, one point three two five, expiring next year with an exercise ratio of two point one. So what happens at the expiry date is it will be cash settled. So basically, um, you will have the um, settlement price minus exercise price divided by exercise ratio. Settlement price depends on different issuers. Some issuer uses the uh, five-day VWAP and some issuer uses the five-day average closing price of the mother share. So what happens is that they will take the um, settlement price minus exercise price. So as I mentioned just now, call warrant, as long as your share price is above your exercise price, there is an intrinsic value and this is what we call in the money warrants in the money call warrants so in the money call warrants uh, if it expires in the money there will be cash settled it will, it will be around for example this example it will be around um four ringgit and 13 cents assuming if let's say your supermax price went up to 10 ringgit on the other hand, the second scenario, let's say if your share price dropped all the way to one ringgit and 30 cents, which is below your exercise price of one ringgit and 325, 1.325, then there'll be no payout. So there'll be no cash uh, payout. The maximum that you actually lose is the amount of money that you actually paid to buy this warrant initially, which is the four ringgit uh, per warrant uh, example. So this is an illustration, but let's say if you we go to a real life scenario. So a real life scenario uh, would be um, to to give you a more pros, uh, better look at it. I might uh, let me show you one of the issuers' uh, website uh, that you can actually do this for a real life scenario on computing and estimating whether your warrant would expire in the money if you plan to hold. So at the screen, you can see that I'm actually showing the slide, but let me um, go to 
this part. Okay, so in one of the uh, warrants issuers uh, website under the warrant calculator, actually, let's say if you type um, Supermax um, C88, for example, so you scroll all the way down, um, you can actually see a simulated price for settlement calculator. So the valuations are all here, there'll be a five days. So you know that this issuer actually uses the five day average closing price because in this website, it shows a five day average closing price. So in order to estimate here, so this would be the, um, this would be the five day average closing price of um, your supermax so per warrant payout is actually here which is four ringgit and uh, 3.56 so if let's say if you type in that you have 1000 units here so the total amount payout to you will be 4356 so this is just a simulated where it can be an example and simulated but you have to check with the other issuers if or any other issuers including this issuer if there is any um, additional charges if it's exercised but this is just a simulation that uh, you can actually look at it so let me go back to the slide um, so this is what we call um, this is what i've covered on the call warrant but uh, recently, there has been more and more, um, basically, call warrant has been the more popular warrant that issuers actually issue in the market. It consists um, quite a large chunk of the total uh, warrants uh, in the market right now. Uh, but recently, um, there has been some issuer that actually have been issuing put warrants over uh, mother share. So I'll cover on actually uh, put warrants. Um, what would the scenario be? So let's take a look again at the moneyness of warrants, but this time from a put warrant perspective. So in the money, at the money, out of the money. So explaining just now, when it came to call warrant, when it was in the money, your share price is actually higher than your exercise price. That's what we call in the money. But when it comes to put warrant, it's the other way around. As long as your share price is below your exercise price, uh, this is what we call the in the money put warrants. But on the other end of the spectrum, if it's out of the money, meaning to say your share price is higher than your exercise price, so that's what we call the out of the money put warrants. So similarly, this is what we call the intrinsic value and time value, same as your call warrant, just that remember put warrant is the other way around. So your view, your view when you go into put warrants is that you think the mother share will go down. That's your view. You are bearish um, about this particular mother share. So that's why um, you decide to actually go into put warrants. So let's look at the end game, just like similar to the call warrant. What happens at the end game? Taking the same mother share, let's say a uh, supermax share price 990, same as the call warrant just now, but tracking the same mother share. So both are tracking the same mother share, both are tracking supermax share, both the share is at 990. Just that one's a put warrant and one is a call warrant. So let's say this put warrant is at 30 cents. So you pay today 30 cents per warrant, and the exercise price is actually um, 250 and expires next year, exercise ratio of 10. So on the expiry date, what happens? It will be cash settled as well. Just that instead of settlement price minus your exercise price, this one will actually be your exercise price minus your settlement price. So as long as your exercise price is higher than your settlement price, um, you will get a cash um, settlement. So similarly, let's say if your share price went to um, two ringgit, right below your exercise price of 250 so you get a total payout of uh, half uh, about five cents so uh, but on the other hand if you are uh, actually what happens if there's another scenario where your share price actually went up at the expiry date it did not go down below your exercise price it actually went above your exercise price because the exercise price is 250 right and your share price went up way above exercise price so then you get no payout as well so um similarly to give you a real life scenario um which is similar to this put warrant uh where on the screen that you can actually see that um this estimation of the put warrant which is similar to the website if let's say I key in supermax dash H. Let's say I choose one of it, HB, for example. 
Because remember, H is put warrant and C is call warrant, right? So even if you click HB and you're not sure whether it's a put warrant or call warrant, you can actually see from this side that actually it says put warrant. Let me show you again. If I say um, C88, it will actually show that it's a call warrant. So going back to here, um, let's find HB. Scroll all the way down has your exercise price and everything and your assuming if this um, is issued by RHB, then you actually use the uh, five day average closing price, right? Then you'll see your payout per warrant. So the payout per warrant is actually zero because your prices, um, your mother share is actually way above um, the exercise price. So if you actually held this until expiry, assuming if today is the expiry, your payout will be actually zero, means there'll be no payout. So again, uh, the thing that um, you would lose if you actually held until expiry is um, the amount that you actually paid in the beginning to actually buy this warrant, which is actually um, 30 cents per warrant. So this, um, this is what the put warrant is uh, compared to the call warrant. So um, now that we know that there are two types of uh, warrants in this market, and I mentioned just now that um, how come when my warrant does not have an intrinsic value, how come there is still some sort of value in my warrants? And remember in the earlier slides, I, I was mentioning that it's uh, due to this thing where we call time value. So as long as your warrants hasn't expired yet, um, you, will always, you will still have some value for your warrants uh, where we call it the time value. So, but the time value tends to actually um, fall at a faster pace. Um, your time decay, that's what we call time decay. It will actually decay at a faster pace, uh, closer to the expiry. Um, so if you can look at this graph here that I'm actually showing right now. So this is what we call the uh, time decay, time decay effect. Sometimes when I buy this warrant, let's take for example, if I buy a call warrant, right? So call warrant, if mother share goes up, my warrant price will go up. So let's say if I take this call warrant, um, let's say Supermax. Okay. Supermax mother share, let's say it did not move at all for the past two days, past three days, if it did not move at all. But how come my warrant value tends to drop even though my mother share stays stagnant? How come my warrant value tends to drop? Let's say it was 20 cents first. And then a few days later, it was 18 cents. But then my mother share didn't move because you mentioned just now, you know, we mentioned just now that it tracks the mother share. This is what we call the time value because even if you're holding on to this warrant, even if there is no movement in your mother share, your warrant value may drop. So, and this is because of the time decay effect. And when it's closer and closer to the maturity date, the expiry date, uh, it tends to drop faster. So it doesn't drop like a straight line, a linear drop. It actually drops like faster towards um, the maturity date. So that's why we always um, like to uh, tell investors or you know inform investors that warrants are generally a trading instrument. So um, you, you have to remember the important things that uh, the expiry date is very important. If you're already holding it uh, and it's close to expiry, you may need to decide if, let's say, if it's going to be out of the money, then uh, you would actually not get anything back and you actually lose the uh, amount that you initially actually bought this warrant. But then if your warrants, because your warrants are still tradable even before the expiry date, um, then maybe, maybe you may want to cut loss to actually uh, um, sell the warrants quickly before it approaches the maturity date if it doesn't go your way. And also another thing to look out is also that warrants, even though it expires uh, today, let's say, and um, the last trading day is actually two days before the expiry date. So your warrants actually get suspended one day before the expiry date. So you need to remember all these dates and uh, some issuers uh, do actually send out some reminders to investors to let them know that the warrants are actually expiring already. Uh, please be aware of the last trading day. Please be aware of when, when, if you actually want to sell back the warrants, this is your last day they can sell back. So this is very important when it comes to um, warrants because of this time decay effect. So besides uh, time decay effect, where a lot of issuers, you might see that when they mention like, oh, uh, 
you might see slower time decay in this, you might see faster time decay in this, it's more for the people who are riskier, or this one is for people who are, who may not uh, be as, uh, may not want to take as much risk as um, the other risk takers. So you come across a lot, a lot of Warren Dingoes that you might be a bit um, overwhelmed sometimes, but what are the other few lingos that the important lingos that you need to think of? So one here, like I mentioned, is time decay. Uh, another thing that I would like to mention is actually the sensitivity and effective hearing. So when you start going into warrants, you might always see this from issuers, sensitivity, effective hearing. But what exactly is sensitivity and effective hearing? So sensitivity in uh, normal, uh, simple terms, it actually means how fast your warrant moves. And effective gearing means how much your warrant actually moves in terms of percentage. So these are the two different uh, very commonly used lingo that you actually hear from issuers, sensitivity and effective gearing. So just remember one is how fast, the other one is how much. So it's a FM, fast and much. So when it comes to these two, uh, they tend to have a payoff between these two. So you may not need, to, you may find that uh, if you want a more sensitive, you might get a lower effective gearing. If you want a less sensitive, your effective gearing might be higher. So when it comes to sensitivity, it's all about responsiveness. How responsive is my warrant to the mother share? And when it comes to effective gearing, it's more of performance, meaning the percentage, the percentage of your warrants. So more responsive, meaning to say a warrant with a lower sensitive sensitivity level, a lower sensitivity number, means it is a more responsive warrant. It means it moves faster as long as your mother share moves. On the other hand, uh usually typically or else remain constant uh, more responsive warrants tend to have a lower effective gearing meaning to say that you might see a lower percentage uh, increase in your uh, warrant but at the same time at the downside you will see also a lower percentage um, losses of with a lower effective gearing so Let's take a look at sensitivity first. Uh, what does it actually tell me? Um, so basically sensitivity, um, like I mentioned just now, is um, how fast, how fast your warrant actually moves, how responsive. So let's say if I'm looking at front can as the mother share, I think front can might go up. I have a bullish view on front can and I would like to gain a leverage exposure. Okay, let me take a look at what are the possible core warrants over front can that I may want to consider. So you take a look at two front can, you, you have two front can um, in front of you. And sometimes you might think like, how come I bought this front can and front can warrant, but when front can moves, my warrant price doesn't move. So it's because of the sensitivity level. So if you bought a more responsive and lower sensitivity level uh, warrant. So sensitivity number, meaning that if you look at the table on your screen, it's actually showing a uh, front can 2.1 ticks. Meaning to say for every two steps of the mother share, when it moves two steps, my warrant price will already move one step. On the other hand, on the right side, when it's front can dash CQ, it has a sensitivity of 6.5 ticks. Meaning if my mother share moves by six to seven ticks, six to seven steps, only my warrant move by one step. So, so sometimes when in a market, you might think that, oh, um, you know, some issue, how come this, uh, this mother share move already, but my warrant still uh, hasn't moved. Is this issuer like, you know, do they cheat my money or is that what happens? Uh, this is boiled down because of the uh, terms of the warrants. So you have to take a look at the uh, terms of the warrants and take a look at the price matrix where it actually can actually show you the different levels of your warrant price in correspondence to your mother share level. So that's basically what uh, sensitivity means. So if your sensitivity number is lower, it means it's more responsive. If your sensitivity number is higher, means it's less responsive. So think of it like the other way around. Lower means more responsive, move faster. 
higher means less responsive, moves slower. On the other hand, on the other spectrum, we have this thing called effective gearing. So what does a higher effective gearing tells me? So typically with a lower effective gearing, your warrant price tends, your warrant tends to have a higher price compared to a higher effective gearing, you tend to see a lower warrant price. So similarly, using the same example of Franken CN and Franken CQ, uh, one was more sensitive, the other was less sensitive. But when it comes to effective gearing, like I mentioned, there is a payoff between sensitivity and effective gearing. So if you want a more responsive one, typically your effective gearing uh, would be lower, meaning to say that your percentage change would be lower as compared to a uh, another similar uh, warrant, call warrant, which has a, a less sensitive, but you tend to have a higher effective gearing and it tends to be cheaper, lower warrant price. I would say lower warrant price, not cheaper, will be lower warrant price. So the same example, assuming my mother share went up by 1.8%, fine can went up by 1.8%. There are two different kinds of warrants. One went up by 4.8% and the other went up by 5.9%. So this is what we meant by one with a higher effective gearing, whereas the other has a lower effective gearing. But if it doesn't go your way, meaning to say if your mother share actually drops negative 1.8%, assuming it goes negative 1.8%, the core warrant front can dash CN and front can dash CQ. Front can CN will drop by negative 4.8% and front can CQ will probably drop by negative 5.9%. So this is what we meant by effective gearing. So in simple terms, uh, in another way of looking at it, effective gearing actually tells you, um, for example, if my share goes up by about 1%, how much percentage will my uh, core warrant actually go up? At the same time, how much percentage it will actually drop if my mother share drops as well? So let's say uh, 2.5 times effective gearing means for every 1% increase, or every 1% change in my mother share, your warrant price could potentially change by 2.5%. So this, this is where you can actually see your effective gearing and sensitivity. Um, probably I can show you in uh, real life. Um, you can probably um, find your effective gearings. Um, So you can probably find your effective gearing and sensitivity numbers here. And you can actually find in other issuers as well um, on their website. Okay, going on to from there. Um, so when it comes to effective gearing and sensitivity, then you, you tend to think like, okay, choosing between both, right? Choosing between sensitivity and effective gearing. So which one do I actually choose, right? Do I go for more sensitive, more responsive, or do I go for higher effective gearing? So if you are someone with um, higher risk, you're a risk taker, so you may want to consider the one that has a higher effective gearing, which is typically less responsive. But if you have a higher risk, uh, because when it actually goes your way, for example, call warrant, if you're using a call warrant, for example, if it goes your way, it means your mother share goes up, your core warrant can actually see a, a greater percentage change uh, compared to the one with a lower effective gearing. But always remember, if a higher effective gearing, meaning to say you are also willing to take a higher risk because if it doesn't go your way, uh, the core warrant will actually drop at a higher percentage uh, compared to those with a lower effective gearing. But then um, what happens is that if you have a lower risk, like on the other spectrum, like I mentioned, that's why you tend to look at the lower effective gearing. So you typically look for the more responsive warrants. So the one that has a higher, a lower sensitivity number, meaning a higher responsiveness. Um, so that's what we, we, we think that if you have higher risk, higher effective gearing, lower risk, maybe more responsive. But when it comes to real life, for example, if I'm already in the market and I need to think, um, 
how in what kind of situation um, do I go for the slightly higher effective gearing as compared to the other lower effective gearing? If I have um, two core warrants over the same mother share, let's just say in real life example. So in real life example, maybe if you are confident that there is going to be a sudden search, sudden search in the mother share, right? Um, then maybe you you don't mind taking that risk. So you might consider the one which is have the higher effective gearing. But if you are someone who is looking at, let's say, let's say you are looking at the trend of the mother share, um, and you think that the share is actually trading sideways or range bound within a certain range, right? Um, then maybe you want to consider the one that is more responsive because then you trade within within that range so that it can go in and out uh, easier, enter and exit easier because as soon as it moves a bit your mother share moves a bit, your warrant actually starts moving already. So that, that's uh, in real life, maybe you might want to consider those that are actually at the range, the range bound. Um, so when when I said that looking at your mother share, like I always stress on, you have to look at your mother share first because a lot of people do ask um, whether uh, you do technical charting on the warrants. The answer is no, you don't because the warrants actually track the performance of the mother share. So you have to have a view on the mother share. You have to do your technical charting on the mother share to only determine whether you have a view that it will go up, range bound, or it will go down. Then only you decide to actually go into the warrants um, accordingly in, based on your view of the mother share. So that's something that, um, that I would like to stress um, to uh, people out there as well. So besides that, also, um, also in a real life examples, you might also think that uh, what are the strategies um, when it comes to warrants, right? So we have two types of strategies actually. So when it comes to warrants, there are two things. You, it's actually we call it the investment strategy or the trading strategy. So if you have a longer investment time horizon, let's say one to two months. Okay, because warrants are usually typically less than a year, uh, on average, maybe eight months. So if you have a longer investment time horizon, maybe three months or more, right? So this is what we call the investment strategy of warrants. You may want to look at warrant that has a lower premium because with a lower premium, generally you will see a slower time decay in the warrants. So uh, when I mentioned earlier on about the time decay, where when it's closer to expiry, you actually see a faster time decay, uh, meaning if your warrants, your mother share don't move, your warrants price can actually drop as well. Um, so what I mean by this, if the warrant has a lower premium, you might see a slower time decay as well. So you may want to consider and look at the uh, warrants that have lower um, premium if your strategy is the investment kind of strategy. But on the other hand, if you are a trader and you are trading, meaning to say maybe uh, you are thinking to actually trade this uh, three days and then exit, or one day, two day, intraday, or three days, as a short period, then you may typically consider a higher warrant price, but a more responsive warrant. So the warrants that has lower sensitivity number, um, you might want to consider a more responsive because uh, you could see a faster change in the warrant. So as you trade uh, intraday or three days, you just want to enter, exit, enter, exit uh, concurrently. So that's what we call the strategy when it comes to warrants. So besides that, also one of the tools that you can actually um, trade these warrants is actually using what we call the price matrix. So a uh, few slides, a couple of slides back just now, I actually mentioned that it's very important to actually do your technical um, technical chart on the mother share and you do not do a technical charting on the warrants itself. Uh, because when, when you look at technical charting in the mother share, you are determining when is your view, when is it going to break, uh, resistance and all those things and when you have to enter, when you have to exit, right? So that's your mother share. But when it comes to warrants, when you want to enter, when you exit, you can actually use this thing, what we call the price matrix. Because the price matrix basically shows you the different levels of your warrant price according to the different levels of your mother share. So if you have a target price of your mother share and you have, uh, you can actually see what is the indicative prices that the issuer is actually placing out there in the market for you. So this is where you can actually decide when you're to enter and when you're to exit your position for your warrants. 
after doing your analysis on your mother share, right? So how do I trade using this price matrix? On the left hand side where the price matrix is, is um, available in some of the issuers website where you can actually take a look at the issuers website. And on the other hand, uh, I have the market price, which is your trading platform. So on issuers site, it's not a site where you can actually trade the warrants. You still need to have your own trading account to actually trade the warrants, just like your market. Uh, the price matrix is just uh, for you to see what are the issuers' prices out there uh, in the market. So let's take, for example, um, this um, Dual Pharma. This was actually 18 September last, um, last month. So uh, Dual Pharma actually, um, let's say if the mother share bid is at 3.26 and the ask is 3.27, the call warren Dual Pharma CG is actually 8.5 cents and 9 cents. So first step is determine your view on the mother share. Do you think it will go up? What is your target price for, for this um, Dual Pharma? Then take a look at the price matrix, uh, which actually shows you the different level and the sensitivity. So if you can see, for example, this price matrix has a different shade of blue and white color uh, that actually determines uh, when the warrant price will actually flip. So in this case, it will flip at when dual farmers bids at 3.3 ringgit and 31 cents, it will flip to 9 cents. So this is how you actually read the price matrix. So the price matrix is also another uh, tool where you can actually use to actually check whether there's any large spread between the warrant bid and ask price. Because when we come when it comes to warrants, uh, when it's a tight spread, meaning it's just a half a cent difference if your warrants is priced below one ringgit. But if you tend to see a large spread, for example, if let's say your bid is eight and a half cent and your ask is actually twelve cents, that's a large spread on your price matrix. This could be uh, indicative from actually issuers that uh, let you know that okay, the the ask price is actually uh, maybe has been increased due to certain reasons, uh, and uh, issuer will probably inform you through their respective um, channels via their website or any uh, their social media like Telegram and so on. So always take a look at a uh, price matrix that has actually a tight spread um, and to ensure that whatever that's on the price matrix and your market is showing the same price because that's your market maker price. Market maker means the issuer is placing there. So if you want to sell back, um, you can actually see that market maker is willing to actually buy back at what price and actually market maker is willing to sell to you at what price. So Think of it like going to, um, let's say, a money changer or so on. You, you see a, a buy price and a sell price. So it's similar to in that concept. Basically, what this price metric is telling you that, okay, this issuer is actually selling to you at, let's say, $0.09. Cents. But if, let's say, it goes up and you want to sell back to us, we actually buy back at $0.08. Cents. And these are the prices that is fair and transparent to actually show you that, what are actually the prices that issuer are actually pricing in the market out there. And last but not least, as I mentioned earlier on, it's also a tool where you can actually determine your entry and exit position accordingly. When should I enter and when should I exit? So maybe let's say you bought it when it was, when Dual Pharma was 3 ringgit and 20 cents. And let's say suddenly you think that, okay, it might go down and I just want to exit my position. So maybe you can just exit before it falls to 3 ringgit and 21 cents because then you will be uh, break even and you might um, actually exit at the price where you bought at. So these are the um, useful things that actually um, I think uh, some of the issuers actually have out there which um, you might have seen that is called the price matrix. So besides the price matrix, I've been talking about the local um, local counters. Um, there is you can also use the price matrix for foreign counters. For example, um, recently um, one of the issuer RHB actually issued four um, Hong Kong listed stock warrants: Alibaba, Tencent, Meituan, and Me uh, in Malaysia. So these warrants are actually traded in in Ringgit Malaysia, listed on Brosa Malaysia, meaning to say you only need you need you only need to have uh, the same Malaysian trading account and you can actually buy these warrants. It's just tracking the performance of the Hong Kong um, Hong Kong listed stocks. 
And actually, those four Alibaba, Meituan, Tencent, Xiaomi actually consist of 82% of the Hong Kong tech index. So if you're not familiar, actually the Hong Kong tech index um, consists of 30 companies that are in the technology um, uh, 30 um, Hong Kong listed companies that are actually in the technology um, um, area. And these four counters that's actually issued in Malaysia, the four Hong Kong stock warrants that's issued in Malaysia, actually made up of 82% in terms of market share as of 24th September, 82% of this HK tech index. So HK tech index is also in uh, uh, Hong Kong. You can actually track it. So using the price matrix for foreign counters, similarly, you can just key in and actually they will actually show you the same uh, price matrix for the foreign counters. So to not confuse yourself, right, since this is listed in Hong Kong, right, so the exercise price is Hong Kong dollars because it's actually tracking the shares that's actually listed in Hong Kong. So when you look at the price matrix, the share, for example, Alibaba is actually Hong Kong dollar. But the Alibaba Dash C1 is actually Ringgit Malaysia. So 30 cents, 31 cents. Similarly to the Xiaomi. So if if actually you if I show you an example, let's say we just go back here and we key in um, Alibaba. Okay, it's actually like lagging right now but basically if you key in alibaba it will actually show the um, alibaba price matrix there actually show the alibaba price matrix there um, you can actually see the different levels of the uh, mother share and the warren price so the warren price again as mentioned is in rm um, whereas the underlying is in hk Hong Kong dollar. Um, and these are some of the data that we actually um, extracted from Bloomberg itself that actually the performance since 28 September because I um, these warrants were actually listed just on 28 September. So it has been a few weeks uh, since it has been listed, close to a month already. Um, basically, if you can see the Alibaba increased by 13% and you can see the leverage that you actually have when it's um, you, the warrants, Alibaba their C1 actually increased by 41% compared to the mother share, which increased by 13%. So these are all the performance of the Hong Kong uh, stock warrants that is actually listed in Malaysia. And the last thing actually to note also is that uh, it's different that um, Hong Kong actually stock warrants market making hours is different to Malaysia. So even though it's listed in the warrants is listed in Malaysia, but because it's tracking the performance of the Hong Kong stock, the market making hours is actually following the Hong Kong market. So these are the market making hours when it comes to Hong Kong. So basically Hong Kong's open later and close earlier compared to Malaysia. So meaning to say after these times, when you see the prices in Bursa Malaysia, it's probably not it's not the market makers' prices. It could be uh, investors' prices out there. So these are the things that you need to be aware when you are actually interested in these Hong Kong stock warrants. So this is actually the last bit where uh, one that I mentioned earlier on, the first thing that I mentioned in this uh, webinar about the advantages to trade uh, warrants uh, during volatile market is this exposure to the foreign market. So if you think that, uh, Malaysia might be uh, volatile and you might want more volatility or you think that you want to look at other markets besides Malaysia, you might want to look at the Hong Kong stock warrants um, where you, you need to just look at those uh, Hong Kong listed stocks and take a view on the mother share there and um, you can trade the warrants here in Malaysia with the same uh, Malaysian trading account and your same brokerage fees and also there is no stamp duty until end of year 2020. So uh, with that, I think um, we can actually um, wrap up um, the this webinar and actually we can actually open up the floor to uh, any questions if there's uh, any questions that uh, we would like to take from the floor. Um, so thank you.
And I think I'll pass back to Shane. Well, <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Amy, for sharing with us how can we trade uh, structural warrants in the Malaysia market. Be okay, 